The Dreamer by Pam Munoz Ryan and Peter Sis. Look around. There's only one thing of danger for you here, Pablo Neruda. I am poetry, waiting to seize the poet. I ask the questions for which all answers exist. I choose no one. I choose everyone. Come closer, if you dare. Rain. On a continent of many songs, in a country shaped like the arm of a tall guitarista, the rain drummed down on the town of Temuco. Neftali Reyes sat, at, sat in his bed, propped up by pillows, and stared at the schoolwork in front of him. His teacher called it simple addition, but it was never simple for him. How he wished the numbers would disappear. He squeezed his eyes closed and then opened them. The twos and threes lifted from the page and waved for the others to join them. The fives and sevens sprang, for, sprang upward, and finally, after much prodding, the fours, ones, and sixes came along. But the nines and zeros would not budge, so the others left them. They held hands in a long procession of tiny figures, flew across the room, and escaped through the window crack. Neftali closed the book and smiled. He certainly could not be expected to finish his homework with only the lazy zeros and nines lolling on the page. He slowly stepped out of bed and to the window, leaning his forehead against the pane and gazing into the backyard. He knew that he should rest in order to recuperate from his illness. He knew that when he wasn't resting, he should catch up on his studies. But there were so many distractions. Outside, the winter world was gray and sodden. The earth turned to mud, and a small stream flowed through a hole in the ramshackle fence. At the moment, no one lived next door. Still, Neftali always imagined a friend on the other side, waiting for him. Someone who might enjoy watching flotsam drift down, downriver, who collected twisted sticks, liked to read, and was not good at mathematics either. He heard footsteps. Was it father? He had been away, working on the railroad for a week, and was due home today. Neftali's heart pounded, and his round brown eyes grew large with panic. The footsteps came closer. Clump, 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 clump. Neftali reached up and smoothed his thick black hair. Was it out of place? He held up his hands and looked at his thin fingers. Were they clean enough? The idea of having to confront father made him it made his arms tingle and his skin feel as if it were shrinking. He took a deep breath and held it. The footsteps passed his room and continued down the hall. Neftali exhaled. It must have been Mamadre, his stepmother, in her wooden-heeled shoes. He listened until he was sure that no one was near. Then he turned to the window again. Raindrops strummed across the zinc roof. Water mysteriously trilled above him, worming its way indoors. Weepy puddles dripped from the ceiling, filling the pots that had been poised to catch them. Blip, blip, blop. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Oip, 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 oip. Blip, 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 blip. Blop. Ting, 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 ting. Blop. Blip, blip. Blip, blip, blip. Oip, oip. As Neftali listened to the piano of wet notes, he looked up at the Andes Mountains, hovering like a white-robed choir. He looked out at the river Cotin, pattering through the forest. He closed his eyes and wondered what lay beyond, past the places of Labranza, Boroa, and Ranquilco, where the sea plucked at the rugged land. The window opened. A carpet of rain swept in and carried Neftali to the distant ocean he had only seen in books. There he was, the captain of a ship, its prow slicing, the, slicing through the blue. 
Salt water sprayed his cheeks. His clothes fluttered against his body. He gripped the mast, looking back on his country, Chile. Naftali, who spoons the water from the cloud to the snow cap to the river and feeds it to the hungry ocean? The screech of a conductor's whistle snapped Naftali to attention. He jerked around. Father's body filled the doorway. Naftali shuddered. Stop that incessant daydreaming. The white tip of father's yellow beard quivered as he clenched and unclenched his narrow jaw. And why are you out of bed? Naftali averted his eyes. Do you want to be a skinny weakling forever and amount to nothing? No, father, stammered Naftali. Your mother was the same, scribbling on bits of paper, her mind always in another world. Naftali rubbed his temples. He had never known his mother. She had died two months after he was born. His father, right? Could daydreaming make you weak? Had it made his mother so weak that she had died? My madre hurried into the room. Father pointed at her. You need to watch him more closely. He must stay in bed or he will never get stronger. As he bounded for the, from the doorway, the floor shook. My madre took Naftali's hand, gently helped him into bed, and tucked the blankets around him. Your mother did not die from her imagination, she whispered. It was a fever. And look at me. I am small and many say much too thin. I may not appear big and strong on the outside, but I am perfectly capable on the inside, just like you. She stroked his head. I know it is hard to spend so many days in bed. I f feel f fine, said Naftali, reaching up to touch it, her black hair, which was pulled into a tight bun at the back of her neck. Just one more day, said Mamadre. I will read to you to help pass the time. Within the lull of Mamadre's soothing voice, Neftali lost himself in the legends of swashbucklers and giants. There, his painful shyness stayed in the back of his mind. There, he could not be called Shinbone because of his thin and sickly body or chosen last for a street game by the neighborhood boys. Between the pages, he forgot that he started when he spoke. He saw himself healthy and strong, like his older brother, Rodolfo, cheerful like his little sister, Laurita, and confident and intelligent like his uncle, Orlando, who owned the local newspaper. While the pages turned, he even dared to imagine himself with a friend. After Mamadre finished reading and slipped away, Naftali studied the cracks in the ceiling. They looked like roads on a map, and he wondered to which country they belonged. He sighed. It had not mattered one bit what father had said about daydreaming. Neftali could not stop. Every curious detail of his life taunted him. His mind wandered. To the monster storm raging outside, which startled the roof. To the distant rumble of the dragon volcano, Mount Jaima, who made the which made the floors hiccup. To the makeshift walls of his timid house, trembling and cowering from the roar of passing trains to the haphazard design of the room with incomplete stairs, which might have led to a castle on another floor, but had long been deserted in the middle of construction. Naftali, to which mystical land does an unfinished staircase lead? The next day, Mamadre was far more watchful, and Naftali could not escape from his bed. Instead, he begged Laurita to be his ambassador at the window. T -t -t Tell me all that you can see, please, porfa. Laurita nodded. She was only four and too short to see out. She pushed a chair to the window and climbed onto the seat. Then she leaned forward. Her round black eyes, heavy lashes, and sleek hair made her look like a little bird perched at the sill. I see rain, <laughs> bumpy sky, wet leaves, one boot missing the other, muddy puddles, un perro callejero. Tell me about the stray dog, said Neftali. What color is it? 
It is so wet, I cannot say. Maybe brown, maybe black, said Laurita. T -t Tell me about the boot that is m missing the other. It has no shoestrings. It looks lonely. Tomorrow when I'm allowed up, I will rescue it and add it to my c c collections. But you already have so many rocks and sticks and nests, and that and the boot will be so dirty, said Laurita. And you do not know where it has been or who's worn it. That is true, said Naftali. B but I will clean it. Maybe it belonged to a stonemason, and by owning it, I will receive his strength. Or maybe it belonged to a baker, and once I run my hands over the leather, I will know how to make bread. Laurita giggled. <laughs> you are silly, Naftali. Just then, Mamadre appeared in the doorway. Laurita, Valeria is here to play with you. And, Naftali, you need a nap or you will not be able to go back to school tomorrow. She came into the room, kissed his forehead, and pulled the blanket up to his chin. You look fine on the outside, my son. How do you feel on the inside? Not tired. P please, Madre, may I read for a while? That is what I deserve for teaching you before you even started school, Mamadre nodded and smiled as she left the room. One story. Nestle grabbed a book from the bedside table. Even though he did not know all of the words, he read the ones he knew. <clears throat> he loved the rhythm of certain words. And when he came to one of his favorites, he read it over and over again. Locomotive, locomotive, locomotive. In his mind, it did not get stuck. He heard the word as if he had said it out loud perfectly. Neftali climbed out of bed, retrieved a pencil and paper, and copied the word, locomotive. He folded the paper into a small square and put it in a dresser drawer, already crammed with other words he'd written on tiny doubled over pieces of paper. Then he crawled into bed. Father's question from yesterday found its way into his thoughts. Do you want to be a skinny weakling forever and amount to nothing? The words in the drawer shuffled. The drawer opened. The small pieces of paper floated into the room and arranged and rearranged themselves into curious patterns above his head. Chocolate, oregano, iguana, terrible locomotive. Naftali sat up, rubbed his eyes, and looked around the room. The words were no longer there. He slid from the bed, tiptoed to the drawer, and opened it. All of the words were sleeping. <laughs>